you know, that's kind of where our message is going to go today because when we look at it, you know, I had a couple of messages I was going through. Uh, yesterday I thought I was all excited. I said, man, it's before 3 o'clock and I've already got the message prepped and I'm good and everything's going good. An hour later it changed. So there I was up to late last night trying to get it all prepped and get it ready for today. But I'm telling y'all, this is a message that uh, needs to be heard in just about every church. Because this message is, will tell you what's wrong, not only with America, but what's wrong with the churches today. We're going to take our text from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, and we'll see where our text is going. So if you would stand in reverence to the word of God, please. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning with open hearts, Father. We welcome you into this place. We invite you to be with amongst us, dear God, that your presence will fill us with your spirit, Lord that you'll move through each and every one of us and touch our hearts in the way we need to be. Lord, we just pray right now that you'll move me out of the way and preach the message to everyone that you see fit, dear Father. For those that are here today and those that are listening in around the country, dear Father, that you'll touch their hearts. you move in mindful ways, dear God. We thank you for the blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We see in that scripture it says... To fear the Lord. You know, one of the things I was kind of puzzling over the last few days was, you know, the Bible tells us to fear the Lord, but then it also tells us that God did not give us a spirit of fear. So in my little simple mind, I'm like, well, how is that working? You know, if I'm not supposed to fear, but I'm supposed to fear, how do I do this? So I had to take the word fear and bring it into the reality of what it truly means in the secular world versus what it means in the Bible. Because there are two big differences, y'all. There are two big differences. You know, the word fear, we typically use in a negative concept. You know, like we fear a gun point as, we fear a snake when we walk up on it, you know, the instant, that instinct of fear comes over us. It's generally in a negative environment. We're afraid of something. But when we're talking about the fear of God, it's not negative or bad. We know God is good, so our Heavenly Father talks about that. So we look at it, and you look at what the Webster Dictionary says. It defines fear as this, an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger, anxious, concern, or unpleasant alarm. But it also notes it means a profound reverence and awe, especially toward God. Amen. That's actually in the dictionary, y'all. A profound reverence. So we look at fear, when we look at what does it mean to fear the Lord first, it serves as an adjective. You know, that awe. When we look at God, we look at God in awe, that love, that reverence, you know. You hear the word reverence, you don't hear that word anymore. Because that's one of the things we have taken out of the churches is the word reverence. We don't, and I'm not talking about how we should all be quiet, we should all just sit there and not make a noise. And that kind of, no, that's not reverence. Reverence is love, it's respect toward God. And God wants us to worship Him. And that's how we show our love and respect Him, is the way we worship Him. And when kid, you worship God by just sitting there and quiet and keeping everything to yourself. I mean, you think about it. Our worship is to be expressed outwardly. You know how we sing. Everybody calls that the worship hour. And then they go into the preaching hour. You know, everybody gets kind of bored when they hear the preaching hour because it's not as entertaining as the worship hour. Because... They say, well, worship hour is supposed to be singing. No, let me tell you something. Worship hour is singing, preaching, testimonies, everything. It's all the same. 
because worship is how we express our love to God through our outward emotions, how we convey to each other. And, you know, that was one thing I loved when I was over in Africa is how they worship. They, you sit there and you listen to them. They dance and they, they all sing, but they express themselves openly. That's something that we don't do in America. We don't know how to express ourselves openly anymore because we're scared to. We're afraid to. We have fear that man has placed on us because, you know, religion has, t has taken the place of God. And that's a problem. We put too much emphasis on the word religion where we miss God and miss it because God is not religion. You know, Jesus is God. God is God. God is love. Religion is something that man came up with for us to follow some laws that they thought would be better than what the Bible put out. And that's the problem we run into today. But you see, it all comes down to, me and Papa was talking the other day, because last Sunday when I heard his message, you know, it was a powerful message. And uh, we was talking that there are enough commentaries to probably wrap around the world over one simple word, belief. We make it so complicated to accept Christ that we've got commentaries that are just miles long on how to accept Christ when it's just as simple as believe. Why? We think we know more than God, so we need to write about it. We need everybody's opinion on it. We need to hear everybody's opinion on it when the Bible says believe. You know, we think that we need to tell people how to love God, how to fear God. We need to tell them on it. No, we don't need to tell anybody how to do it. We just need to tell you it comes from the heart. Your love of God is between you and God. I can't tell you how to do it. I can't tell you how it works for you or how it works for me. Everybody's different. But the thing is, it's a reverence. It's a, awe, it's a respect toward God. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's not something that you're afraid of Him. No. I'm saying you respect God. You love Him because when it comes down to the end, it's God that can send you to a place of paradise or a place of torture, depending on what choice you made here. Second, fear of the Lord can also mean fear, all respect. We as humans believe having Lord in a relationship we have with him. We see that it's a relationship. If Jesus died for us to have a relationship with the Father, he died to cleanse us of our sins so that through the precious blood, we can have a relationship with God himself. That's what he died for. That's what he came upon the earth, bled, died, and was crucified for. You know, the thing is that we've replaced that love that we have for Christ with fear. Fear of, to be ourselves as Christians. I mean, you think about it. You know, we're doing a lot of research and a lot of things, and I'm watching a lot of different movies based on spiritual warfare. And you look way back in the day, People wasn't afraid to stand up for their beliefs. Where are those same people at today? That generation is died out. The generation today, they're either too old to, to stand up anymore, and the younger generation don't want to do it because they're scared they're going to offend someone. They're scared they're going to upset somebody's feelings, and that person's going to turn around and sue them. Why? Because people have. Uh, churches have been sued because they didn't want to do same-sex marriages. You know, business has been sued because they didn't want to allow certain people in it. Things People are scared to speak anymore because they're scared that someone's going to sue them or take everything from them. Here's the problem we're facing today. You're scared to lose materialistic stuff than you are to stand up for God. There's a problem. We don't want to lose what God has given us as far as material items instead of standing up for God. We would rather be quiet, sit in a closet, and keep all of our possessions and not have anybody bother us than we would stand up for the word of God and lose it all. The Bible says, what profit of man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What's the, what is it? What is it going to do us any good if we hold all of our possessions but in the midst of it, we lost our soul in the process. Because when we die, 
How many of y'all have ever seen a U-Haul on the back of a hearse? None. No U-Hauls go to the graveyard because you can't take it with you when you go. Job said it best. Naked I came in this world, naked I will leave. Came in with nothing, we'll leave with nothing. The one thing I gained in this life is when I leave, I'm going home. So I am going somewhere to a place of peace and paradise. But if we don't choose that love of God and we choose to live for possessions, that place you go next is not going to be a pleasant one. You see, so how is the fear of the Lord used in the Bible? It's assurance such as do not fear for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed for I'm your God. We see in Isaiah, he says, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And then to Joshua, it says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. But then in Proverbs, it gives us a little bit different detail of what fear is. Because fear of God brings wisdom. When you look in the first verses of Proverbs, you'll see that. I mean, we look at Proverbs chapter 1. Let's all look there real quick. Let me. In Proverbs chapter 1, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand the words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing and righteous justice of equality, to give prudence to simple knowledge and discretion to youth. You see, in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that's true. It is the beginning. You see, fools despise wisdom and instruction. The people that don't want to seek wisdom don't love the Lord. You see that with loss. And I'm not calling them fools or idiots, but I'm saying they don't want to seek the wisdom of the Lord. They don't want to know God's wisdom because they don't love the Lord. You see, Proverbs shows us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And let me tell you something. Knowledge is your greatest weapon sometimes. To know what is coming, to know what's out there, to know how to pray and what to pray for. Because when it comes down to the battle, the best battle ever fought is on your knees in prayer. You see, that's because that fear of the Lord is in you. That love for God, that reverence for God, knowing that he goes before you. That's what it means to fear the Lord. You see, where else is fear in the Bible? You see, James begins his book by pointing to the Father foremost, nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You see, James goes on to talk about a lot of things in there, but a lot of it goes back to you ask. But you see, the thing is, when we ask God, how are we asking through whose power and authority are we asking God for something? Are we asking through our own power? Or are we asking through the power of Christ? You see, the thing is, when we ask God for something, we have to be living in his will. We have to have that fear of the Lord in us for that prayer and that ask to be answered. And I'm not saying you go out there and you ask for a new car. God will give you what you need. He's not going to give you what you want. But he will give you what you need if you are in the will of the Lord and ask. And that's one thing, you know, last week when we celebrated my grandparents' 70th anniversary at that, at that church, one thing everyone talked about was how God provided for them because they lived by faith. How they lived by faith? Because they lived through the will of the Lord. They lived in God's will. God provided for them what they needed. Not what they wanted, but what they needed at the time. And when they ran the rescue mission, when they had the boys home, they had many different things. God always met the need every week. Every week it was met. Some people would say, how is that even possible? Because when they looked at the, you know, they didn't have jobs. My grandparents never had a job. 
Our grandfather would preach and so often, but back then, when he was doing the boys' home, he was not a full-time preacher. My grandmother, she stayed at home. And they, they had, at the most, at one given time, Papa said that the most they had was about 45 boys in a home that they were running. Neither one of them worked. But then boys had meals every day that was provided because why? They had a love for God and God met the need. That's how we live and that's how we should live by faith. You see, God is the ultimate source, the star from which all things come from. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth of knowledge and understanding. So those words are echoed by Jesus who tells his followers, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find knock and it will be open. See, Jesus tells them that right there. But then we go on to say, you know, that's what fear is. But then we see, also it tells us in 2 Timothy, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. So we see, when you look at this from a secular standpoint, they would tell you the Bible is contradicting itself. Because on one hand, the Bible is saying fear God, but on the other hand, it's saying God didn't give you a spirit of fear. From a secular standpoint, you will see that this is a contradictory, but it's not. Because the word fear is used in a different language than what they're used to. No one's used to seeing the word fear as love. They're not used to that. Why? Because they don't have the knowledge of Christ in them. They don't have the spirit inside them to show them the difference. And see, Christians are commanded in Scripture not to fear because we have God. You know, there's 300, I believe it's 366 verses in the Bible that says, do not fear. One for each day of the year, including leap year. It says, do not fear. Because God tells us not to fear because why? We have him. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. He's on our side. So what is fear? Fear is a false expectations appearing real. False expectations appearing real. That's fear. We think. We think we know it all. We think we got it all under control. But it's just a false expectation. It's not real. It is what the world wants us to believe. I mean, when you look at it, Satan has been working since the beginning of time to make mankind believe he's not real. And he's just about accomplished it. Because there's more people out there today that don't believe in Satan than there are that do. And it, it, he's just about accomplishment. And you see, more importantly, fear forgets that God is God. That's the problem with fear. When we allow that fear to consume us, the fear of the world, the fear of man to consume us, we forget God's in control. We think we got to fix it. When God tells us, do not fear man. Man can only destroy the body. After that, he's done. He can kill you. He can kill the body. After that, he has no more control. God has all the power to take the body and the soul. So what does America really fear today? In the top 10 fears of 2022, 62% said they were afraid of go corrupt government officials. 60% were afraid of people I love becoming ill. 59% were fear of Russia using nuclear weapons. 58% people I love dying. 56% we're afraid of the U.S. becoming involved in another world war. 54% of pollution of drinking water. 53.7% not having enough money for the future. Another 53% economic and financial collapse. Then 52 is pollution of oceans, rivers, and lakes. And 51 biological warfare. None of that has God in it. None of that was America afraid that the world would come to an end and they would go to hell. None of that was about, you know, the, the churches would start closing the doors because no one wants to go anymore. You see, 
Satan has done his job because in those top 10 fears of last year, none of it mentioned God. He's accomplished what he wanted. He's taken mankind and taken him and turned him against God because now man doesn't worry about God. Man believes he's his own God. And that's what Satan wanted. And here's the, here's the, the, the biggest thing to think of a lot of times. Satan just sits back and we do it to ourselves and watch us. And he's sitting there saying, I couldn't have done it better myself. Because we are our own worst enemy when it comes to the things of this world. We want, we desire, we envy, we're jealous. We are our own worst enemy. And until we overcome all those spirits of the flesh, that when Paul was talking about when he's writing about the principalities of darkness, well, until we overcome all of that, I can tell you something. We're not going to know God. This world is on a downward spiral. And I don't think it's ever going to recover. I, I, you know, it would take a true act of God. And I'm not one to question God to say he can't. If God wants this world to recover, he will. If he wants it to end, he will. But I'm telling you right now, just like I told y'all when we went through the book of Revelations, you can watch everything you want to know on the news. You can read the Bible front to back and memorize every scripture. But none of that matters unless you can answer one question at the end of the night. If the world starts tomorrow without you, are you ready? That's the question you have to answer. Where are you going to go? You see, when we look at that spirit of fear, what are we afraid of today? Diseases, weapons, sickness, money problems. We look at that as fear. You know, that's the thing that scares us. But you see, there are consequences if we do not heed God's wisdom and word. Because what if we do not fear the Lord? If we don't fear God, what will, what will happen? You won't fear sin. You will be rebellious. You will miss out on God's blessings. You will increase in moral perversion. And you will face God's eternal judgment. You see in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You see we do not merely listen to the word. And so we deceive ourselves. If we just listen we deceive ourselves because why we're not accepting it. We have to accept it and apply it. You know, there's going to be a lot of people in hell because they believed in their mind they were saved. Yeah, and that's the thing. Who do you think is gaining more people today? Heaven or hell? A sad reality? Hell is. But you want to know what's even sadder than that? There's more prayer meetings in hell than there are in churches today. Because the people in hell are begging, just give me one minute. All I need is just one more minute, a few seconds, to say, Lord, forgive me. They wish they had those few seconds just to say, Lord, forgive me. But you see, the world will tell you that it's not real. That it doesn't exist. It's just some archaic thing that Christians use to scare people into believing in the supernatural. They would tell you that demons don't exist, demon possessions don't exist, all this stuff doesn't exist, but it's real. The Bible talks about we face a, a war in heaven. You know, we face a war between good and evil. There's a war out there happening every, time, every day around us. We can't see it, but it's there. You know, and that's the thing. With no fear of God, there is no godly wisdom. With no godly wisdom, there will be no wise choices. And the wisest choice you or anyone could ever make is to repent and put your trust in Christ. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Without God, where is our moral compass? If people don't believe in God, which way is their compass pointing? You Matthew Henry 
wisely wrote one time, where no fear of God is, no good is to be expected. You see, one of the things when there's no fear of God, we call what is good evil, and what is evil we call good. Look at our world today. Have we not changed it? Think about one simple word. Have you heard one simple word? Shame. When's the last time you've heard the word shame? Remember growing up, you used to hear you should be ashamed of yourself. People don't use that anymore. Why? Because it don't exist in the vocabulary. They've taken the word shame and moved it out. Because what is good is now bad, and what was what is bad is now good. That's in the world standards. See, America does not have any love or reverence for the Lord. And you see how fast she's falling. Where is your fear today? You know, Jesus said, where your treasures are, there is where your heart will be also. Amen. That's true. People could sit here and look at me all day long and pay attention to what I'm saying. <laughs> But what's on their thoughts and what's in their heart right now will tell you everything you need to know about your relationship with God. You go to big churches and you'll see thousands of people there. And over half of them will sit there and tell you they're looking to watch. They're thinking about the ball game. They're thinking about what they're going to do when they get home. The food that's on the stove. What's going on? Not one of them is thinking about God. And I'm telling you, if that's the case with anyone here today, it would be better if you didn't even come. You say, but that's kind of harsh. Yeah, it is harsh. But if you don't walk through them doors expecting to be blessed by God, it would be better if you just turn around and go back home. Amen. Because that's what should be. We should walk through those doors expecting God to show up. When we walk through those doors, we should have a spirit of expectancy inside of us. Not sit down in a pew and say, bless me if you can, preacher. Because it only takes one to quench the spirit for everybody. It only takes one. And let me tell you something. If you don't believe me, the devil is sitting on the front row pews of the churches today. Orchestrating every little thing he can. But like I said, I ended today with this. Where is your fear today? Is it in man or is it in God? Where is your fear? Because that right there will let you know where you're going to go if tomorrow never comes. Let us stand.